ninth stand-up comedy special for HBO called George Carlin Back in Town, airing repeatedly and starting tomorrow night at 9.45 Eastern and Pacific, 8.45 Central, and for some reason that even George can't tell you, 7.45 in Denver, Colorado. Yes. I've seen the first 15 minutes of this. I Good. cannot wait to get home tonight and watch your finish. Congratulations, you. sir. You're Thank at the you. top of your game. Uh, Unbel I, I believe uh, that, and I thank you for, for saying that. Before, be, before we get to one of my favorite topics, I want to ask you for your commentary on the recently departed Easter season. Well, no, the only thing I noticed over the Easter weekend, I noticed an absence of something. They never warn, they never have warnings about drunk driving on Easter weekend. It's always Christmas right. and New Year's, and I just don't understand why. People aren't getting drunk on Easter weekend. Well, but they are, but we, yeah. it's selective, as you pointed they, they out. They just about don't, they don't bother warning you. Only you would observe that. That's true. How do you have this facility to pick up <laughs> stuff like that? I don't know. I, I noticed the absence of B batteries. We have A, double A, <laughs> A, double A, triple A. Look how hard they tried to avoid it. They went to triple A, then they skipped a C, and then D. Uh, and also, you will find there are no green flowers, which is an odd thing. It's because the green is all around the flowers, as if there wasn't enough green right. to go into the flower. And there are no brown running shoes. Have you ever noticed? You never see brown <laughs> sneakers. Gray, white, tan, sil not tan, silver, red, flex, blue, no tan. I watched, as I told you, 10, 15 minutes to prep myself. Yeah. And I want you to go through here the concept of the Monday night crucifixions at halftime in Monday night football. Well, it's just that I believe if you're going to have, t if you're gonna have uh, executions, you've got to have them. got to be a little more entertaining. You've got to raise some money to balance the budget. Right. And you sell commercials. You put them on halftime on Monday night, the Monday night crucifixions. I mean, wouldn't you like to hear Dan Deardorff explain why the nails have to go in at a certain <laughs> angle? <laughs> it's a... Uh, but as you point out at the beginning of your monologue on this, on, on this concept, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be dealing here with drug dealers. We'd be dealing with... Bankers. Bankers. The bankers who launder the drug money. We're killing all the wrong people. We should be going after these CEOs. That's another thing I noticed. We should be executing CEOs by the carload. And, and, <laughs> uh, and you, know, you know how they warn a community... By the when, carload. When a, when a rapist is let out of jail and they have to warn the community that he's moving in there? Well, how about the child molester they're letting yeah. out now? Yeah. Well, they should do this with these, with these white-collar people. Let them know a businessman criminal is coming into your neighborhood. Be warned, because these are the most lethal people in the world. So, in any event, you advocate that we, w that we execute the uh, bankers. bankers who launder the As drug money. As an example. Money. And that if we did this enough times on Monday Night Football in the form of the Monday Night Crucifixion, we would see the drug traffic yeah. dying down you real fast. You start nailing one white, middle-class Republican banker per week to a big wooden cross on national TV, that drug traffic is going to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I often wonder why you and I could go within five blocks of this building and buy almost anything we want in terms yeah. of substance and abuse ourselves. Would you like to try and go out and buy one Cuban cigar? Can't find him. Yeah, right. why, why don't we get the guy who's in charge of that and put him in charge of the drugs? Makes sense to yeah, me. Absolutely. Anyway, the Beacon Street Theater, which is the venue for this... Uh, well, the Beacon Theater. Beacon Theater, yeah. which is the venue for this HBO special, is almost your old neighborhood, isn't it? Yes, it's about two, uh, two miles south on Broadway from where I grew up in the 120s. I grew up on 121st Street, hung around on 23rd. Right. And this was on 74th. It's one of the theaters I used to sneak into as a child. It's, it's the theater, in fact, that Jimmy Griffin, up in the balcony, tore off a wooden armrest and threw it onto the people in the orchestra. <laughs> which I asked the audience not to do during my performance. <laughs> it was a great old theater, one of those old vaudeville come movie, come uh, rock and roll venues. And did you go around the neighborhood while you were there oh, uh, yeah. visiting old haunts? Well, I always do that anyway. I'm, I'm very attached and connected to my own childhood and Roots, past. Of and a wonderful neighborhood because it, it, was, it was a neighborhood on the, uh, on the seam between Harlem and Columbia University, Grant's mm -hmm. Tomb, St. John the Divine, Riverside Church, Barnard College, Teachers College, Juilliard School of Music. We had this incredible institutional, educational neighborhood on one side, and then down the hill toward the road to hell, we had the tougher side. You had the uh, little Irish enclave, and we had Cuban and Puerto Rican and, and, and black, and, and the mixture, the, 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 the scene between them is always wonderful because the people in the middle of a segregated area they have attitudes. The people in the middle of the white area, the people in the middle of the black area, have attitudes they can, uh, they can uh, tolerate, they can, they can uh, uh, entertain certain attitudes. Mm -hmm. But when you live on the, on the border, you have to develop a second uh, attitude that, that includes both sides. Right. And that was what was always right. interesting right. to me. And did you have early aspirations to be in show business? Oh, yes. 
No, I was a funny kid. I mean, I was a mimic. R really? My mother would... <laughs> I never would have guessed. My mother... I was imitating Mae West when I was five years old, and I had never seen her. Really? My mother showed me... Interesting that you would choose to imitate Mae West rather than W.C. Fields. Well, my, my father, if he, if he had been around, and unfortunately he was asked to leave at an, when I was very young. He didn't metabolize ethanol very successfully. <laughs> we discussed that the last time you and were And he here. was asked, there's your hat, Pat, we'll see you. Yeah. So uh, I, he would have recommended W.C. Fields, but my mother taught me Mae West. You know, you come up and see me sometime, however. There's that a pipe in your pocket. But I, I was also able to do Johnny the Philip Morris Midget, call for Philip Morris, and the priest in our parish who had been gassed in the First World War and had a very peculiar cough, Father Ford. <coughs> <coughs> he was always clearing his throat. And these were the impressions that somehow I got by with this stuff until I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was on the stoop all the time entertaining. I, I, I could imitate all the people in the neighborhood, the shop owners, the parents of other kids, the yeah, cops, the teachers. You told us the, the last time you were here, but did, did, you, did you sneak into the Beacon and other theaters to see yeah. The pictures? Yeah, we used and, to sneak. And the live shows, they used to have live show in A little pictures. farther down, a little farther down Broadway, the Capitol Theater, the Strand, right. had the live shows in the Paramount. And uh, the, Exit 26 was the way you got into the Strand. That was a big door on the side of the orchestra. And of course, when you open the door in the daytime, Light comes Light. in the movie theater, yeah. so everybody has to run in a different direction because the slogan was, they can only catch one of us, which was usually true. And would, would you want autographs from the people that did the live shows? Were yeah. you an autograph collector? Yeah, I was an autograph kid. I, I would hang around the stage door. I knew the schedules. Uh, I, but I wound up with people like Derwood Kirby. I had the oddest autograph collection. I had Poopy Campo, Harvey Stone, and Derwood Kirby and other guys were getting like Babe Ruth. And what did Der what did Kirby do? Because Derwood Kirby was the announcer for the Gary Moore show that, on television. That's right. Everybody and knows him from that. Well, he and had he did some Broadway acting too following This that. was this was his CBS radio show at fifty second street over at Madison Avenue, where he had the Derwood Kirby show. Hey, big <laughs> you know. <laughs> didn't last a long time, but it was makes a good, no difference. It, it got on the show. air. Got it's on the air. Show. And were there autographs like that you didn't get where you tried and somebody Danny Kay. He was my idol. Do you want to hear a sad story? Yeah. He was my idol. I loved him. I went to the movies, and I used to write letters to Sylvia Fine. I didn't know it was his wife, but mm -hmm. she had her name on those songs. And I'd say, send me a copy of that. I can learn. I can do that. And I looked at him, and I thought, I can do that. That verbal facility was so attractive, and then the, the accents he could yep. do. And I, just, I just, just wanted to be like him. And he came to uh, the Roxy or Radio City. I forget which yeah. of the two theaters. And I knew the schedule, and I waited for him at the side door. And, uh, and like, were you a respectful kid? You didn't. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. No, and I was the only person waiting that day. It was a rainy day. I wasn't in the rain itself, but it was raining a few feet from where I was standing. Right. It was cold. And I waited for him for about an hour. And he came in by taxi, came out of the cab, and just walked past me. He says, I don't sign autographs. I don't sign no. autographs. No. And then later he became famous for being nice to children on UNICEF. And I never trusted that. I told him, if he wouldn't give me an autograph, I'm standing there alone. What's he yeah. going to India and putting kids on his lap for? Yeah. You know. Well, lap is one thing, autograph is another. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>